In this video, we're going to use the Navier-Stokes equations to solve for fully developed flow between parallel plates. This type of flow is commonly known as Poisson flow. Here's an overview of the problem that we're going to solve. We have a channel with the origin located in the center of the channel. It's the center line, x direction, y direction. The channel then goes from y equals minus h to y equals h, so it has a total height of 2h. We want to solve the velocity profile in fully developed, pressure-driven flow between parallel plates. Fully developed means that the derivatives of the velocity components in the x direction are equal to zero. That is, any profile of velocity that we have in the channel is not changing as we move in the x direction. We have what's commonly referred to as the no-slip condition, which means that the velocity of the fluid at the wall has the same velocity as the wall. These are stationary walls, and so the velocity for any x at plus or minus h is equal to zero, both the u component and the v component and will allow for body forces. We'll give the acceleration due to gravity with the acceleration in the minus j direction. So let's look at our full set of governing equations and let's start by remembering that we have the potential for a three-dimensional problem. So we have the x component of momentum, the y component of momentum, the z component of momentum, and we also have our conservation of mass equation. In deriving these momentum equations up here, we had constant viscosity, we had an assumption of constant viscosity, constant density, or it's incompressible, and we used the stress-strain rate relation for a Newtonian fluid. So we also have a Newtonian fluid. So we're going to use these equations and we're going to simplify them in order to get the solution to this particular problem. Always it's very good to start all of your problems by stating the assumptions. I know when I mark exams and when I write exam questions, I write, state all assumptions, and there are always marks assigned for clearly stating your assumptions. Very good practice to start your problem by stating those assumptions. So the ones that we know <coughs> clearly from the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations is that we have constant viscosity, constant density, it's a Newtonian fluid, we're going to say it's a two-dimensional problem and ignore any variations in the third direction. We're going to say it's a steady problem, and we'll see in a moment that we can cancel out all of the time terms. We're given in the problem that it's fully developed, but that's a, that will be an assumption relevant to our solution. And we could perhaps list this as an assumption as well. It's a given condition. The no-slip condition is applied at the walls, non-moving walls, and so zero velocity on the walls. So let's first look at the fact that it's steady. In fact, that it's steady means in all of these equations, we can cancel out these time derivatives. So steady, not varying in time, all derivatives with respect to time go to zero. And now it's two-dimensional. and That means that all of the variations in the z direction are going to cancel out, as well as any w velocity is going to cancel out. So that two-dimensional is going to take out all of these derivatives with respect to z. It's going to take out this. We don't have a body force in the z direction. We Everything is zero in that z direction. So here's a variation with respect to z. Here's a w which is zero, a w which is zero, and again w, 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 w. We see that the two dimension gets rid of the entire z momentum equation. Not surprisingly, we could have done this without individually cancelling out every term. We know that's going to be the case, but why not show it? Okay, so there's our two-dimensional, and we're down to already significantly less terms. I've missed that one in the conservation of mass equation. Okay, so let's move on and look at the fully developed assumption first. Let me quickly cross off the terms that we had already crossed off. The steady got rid of those three. The z terms got rid of this one and this one and this one and this one. So fully developed means that those velocity derivatives, those changes in velocity in the x direction are zero. So right away that will tell us that this term is going to be zero, this term is going to be zero, this term is going to be zero, but now let's look a little more carefully. If du dx is zero, here's what we have left, left of our conservation of mass equation. And if du, x, du dx is zero because of the fully developed assumption, then that leaves this term as zero, and dv dy is also zero. And so we can get rid of this term here, and if we think about it, we can, we can get rid of one more uh, term here right off the bat. If the velocity is zero on the wall. We know the no-slip condition tells us that v velocity is zero on the wall, and now we see that there is no variation dv dy is zero from our conservation of mass equation. That means that v has to be zero everywhere. And so all of those terms with a v we can additionally cancel out because of that fully developed 
because we saw from the fully developed the du dx cancelled out, and because du dx was zero, dv dy was zero, and because dv dy is zero, and it's zero on the boundary, v is everywhere zero. And so that means this term cancels out, and this term cancels out. And what do we notice? All of the terms in the inertia force have cancelled out, every single one of them. The inertia force is zero, and whatever we have left here is going to be a balance uh, between, and of course we're finished with this equation, whatever we have left here is going to be a balance between what's left over. It's going to be a balance between perhaps gravitational forces, body forces, between the pressure forces and the terms remaining in the viscous forces. Great, so our equations are much, much simpler now. This is all we have left are these terms here, and of course gx is zero, and so that term will go away as well. Let's start with the y momentum equation. What's left with those terms was zero is equal to the body force minus the pressure forces. We do have a pressure force term here, so let's go ahead and integrate this. We rearrange the pressure gradient is equal to the pressure forces, the difference in the pressure forces acting on any volume that I choose to draw. If I draw my volume like this, the difference between the pressure up here and the pressure down here is balanced by the body force or the weight of the fluid in this volume. Well, that's exactly the hydrostatic condition. And of course, if we integrate that, we see that we get the hydrostatic distribution. And because we're integrating with respect to y, there could have been an arbitrary function of x there, so we'll put it there for completeness. But either way, clearly we have the hydrostatic distribution. Even if there were a function of x there, if we take the derivative of this with respect to x, that term would go to zero. There's no x in this term. And so for sure, the derivative of pressure with respect to x is not a function of y, or the pressure gradient in the x direction is not a function of y. So basically what we got from y momentum is that we get the hydrostatic distribution for the pressure in the y direction. Now let's go to the x momentum. We had these terms here. The inertia term had canceled out. Every term in the inertia term had cancelled out. We have a zero for gx, and so that term is equal to zero. And we're left with a balance between the difference in the pressure forces. And remember, if I draw a volume here, dpdx is telling me per unit volume the difference between the pressure here and the pressure times the area here and the pressure times the area here is this value here. So the pressure forces acting on my control volume are balanced by the viscous forces acting on the control volume. So we can now, because the only variation we have in the y is in the y direction, we can change our partial derivative to a normal derivative. And of course, simplifying, we get this expression here, which we can integrate twice in order to get that the velocity gradient is 1 over mu dp dx y plus constant 1. We can integrate again. y squared is equal to 1 over 2 mu dp dx y squared constant 1 times y plus c2. So there's where we are. And now we need to solve for these constants. We do that by introducing the boundary conditions. The first boundary condition is that at the top wall where y is equal to h, the u component of velocity is equal to 0. So the velocity is 0 and the y's have been substituted in for h's. If I apply the boundary condition at the bottom wall, the u component of the velocity is zero along the bottom wall. And so again, I can write this expression here where I've now substituted minus h in for the y's. And now I see that if I add these two equations, I'm going to eliminate constant one and I'll be able to solve for constant two. And so we do that, adding these two equations, I get this expression here where constant one has been eliminated, and from that I can directly solve for constant 2 being this value here. Now I can put constant 2 back into this equation up here and solve for constant 1. We can take this expression here and we can put it back into this equation and solve for c1. And we see that this term here is exactly this term here, except that it's negative here and positive here, and so c2 and this term are going to be zero identically, and therefore c1 is equal to zero as well. So c1 is equal to zero. And now we've solved for a velocity profile in this flow, two constants being solved for, 
substitute them into the expression. And of course, with these two terms being, being the same, this having a negative, we get, we can simplify it to say the velocity profile is one over two mu dp dx y squared minus h squared. And that is a quadratic in y, it's parabolic in y. And when y is equal to zero, this is going to give me the maximum value. I can also very clearly see here, because it's negative h squared, that dp dx has to be a negative constant because the bigger the pressure gradient, the higher pressure that I put here, the more flow we're gonna drive through this channel. This has to be negative. We'll have a higher pressure here, driving the flow in this direction, a lower pressure here, meaning that dp dx is a negative constant. So it's a parabolic velocity profile with a maximum at the channel center line where y is equal to zero. dp dx is a constant that determines the maximum velocity and the flow rate in the channel. Now I've solved this using open foam in a, in a two-dimensional channel where I have respected the fully developed condition. And here I've shown the velocity vectors. Of course, it's fully developed, so there's no change in this profile anywhere in the x direction, and all of these velocity profiles are identically the same. And now I can look anywhere at one of these, and I can look as a function of y going from minus h to h. I can solve, I can plot the velocity profile and see that it does in fact, give me this solution that we just solved for, a very nice parabola given by the expression on the previous slide. Now we're gonna look at some more features of this. I wanna look at the flow rate in this pressure-driven channel. Now that I've solved for the velocity, I can know everything I wanna know about this flow. And so if I wanna solve for the, vo for the volume flow rate, the volume flow rate Q is gonna be V dot N to, the, to give me the component of velocity, which is normal, to the component of the velocity, which is perpendicular to a plane of constant x that's carrying volume flow into or out of my volume. And of course, v dot n is nothing other than the u component of the velocity. So the volume flow rate is the integral over the area of u dA. We've solved for dA, or sorry, we've solved for u. And we know that dA, if we take it per unit depth into the screen, dA is going to be 1 dy, and of course the limits of integration are going to go from the bottom, minus h, to h at the top of my channel. And so Q is integrating, substituting in for u, dA, and integrating from the bottom wall to the top wall. If I carry out that integration, of course dP dx is a constant, we've shown that. We can pull that out, viscosity is constant, that was one of our assumptions. So we can pull that out, and we have a simple polynomial to integrate with respect to y. We can do that, put the limits of integrations across there, and then substitute in our limits of integration uh, like this, and simplify that expression, and I end up with the volume flow rate is equal to one over two mu times my constant, which I know is negative, dp dx, times minus four thirds h cubed, and again, the fact that this is negative is again showing me that dp dx has to be negative, which I know already on physical grounds, in order to say that when the pressure is higher here and the pressure is lower here, I will get a positive flow rate through this channel. And there it is, finally simplified, the volume flow rate through our pressure-driven flow, and again, to highlight what I just said. And here is again the solution of the computational fluid dynamics uh, software solving the full Navier-Stokes equations and showing that it does these simplifications that give us this analytical solution are, of course, correct. And so this is now the x direction here. So we're going from the inlet of this channel to the outlet of this channel, and we see that the pressure is dropping linearly, or dp dx is a constant. The difference in pressure, the difference in pressure for any given distance is a slope of the pressure distribution is constant. It is a straight line distribution. And we see if we look at the two-dimensional plot that we do have this linear variation in y or we do have the hydrostatic variation because we accounted for the body forces. And so in the y direction we have the weight of the fluid being balanced by the pressure forces. We can also solve for the average velocity in the channel. It's actually quite a simple operation. We know that we have Q, the volume flow rate, is equal to the area, the cross-sectional area, times 
the average velocity and the average velocity that conserves mass. So all I have to do is divide my Q by this area. And this area is going to be, remember the channel height was 2H. And so it's 2H times 1 into the screen. And so if I divide Q by 2H, then I get my expression for the average velocity. And if I want, I can solve for U max. That is where Y is equal to 0, the maximum velocity at the center of the channel where Y is equal to 0. And then I can simplify this expression and see that for this two-dimensional flow between parallel plates, the average velocity is two-thirds of the maximum. And that's what I've used to draw this red line here. That is the average velocity that I would use if I want to use a single velocity which represents the mass flows in this channel. And for your information, if we solve this in a pipe using cylindrical coordinates, we could do all of this again um, very similar using the cylindrical coordinates in a, in a pipe. And we would see that the uh, average velocity is one half of the maximum velocity in a pipe flow, a cylindrical pipe flow. Okay, so we've seen an example of how we can solve, simplify the Navier-Stokes equations and the conservation of mass equation to solve a very practical flow. And we've learned a lot about it that's going to be very useful when we do our pipe flow later in the course.